Quick couple of background things. Uh, I'm from Chicago. I tend to talk fast. I'll try and not talk too fast. When I talk slow, it sounds sarcastic. So just kind of <laughs> just kind of bear with me in that I'm not being sarcastic. It just kind of happens that way. Uh, talk about this this idea of using product thinking uh, around architecture, um, and hopefully uh, I don't go too long here. So here's here's kind of my take on this world. Um, my background, not that it's even that interesting. Uh, before I was doing this consulting stuff, I was an architect at the Mercantile Exchange in Chicago, so Futures and Options Board, all that you know, low latency, high throughput systems. Uh, I did that for a while, uh, left there for a variety of reasons, uh, started doing some of this Agile stuff, left the Agile space for a while in 2007-ish, I went to a Red Hat, I was an architect for Red Hat for a few years. Uh, and I left Red Hat because I got into this space where I'd be brought into clients and they'd want to talk about architecture, architecture, architecture. Tell us how to do these systems. How should we do these things? And they would be missing and lacking so much context that the architecture just wasn't interesting. You know, if you come in and you already have an idea and you say, how do we do a business rules engine? But you don't know why you're doing it or you don't know how it's solving problems. It just wasn't that interesting. So after doing enough of those, I just kind of gave up and said, I'm going to go into this space and try and help organizations figure out how to build the right thing the right way. That's kind of where I'm at. This talk's been evolving for about two years. Uh, it started off because one, uh, so I'll use some agile terms just to kind of throw it out there for you. Uh, but I'm not like the agile guy that's going to be make sure you use all the words the right way, blah, blah, blah. I was at one group and an, and an agile consultant came in and said, there is no architecture in agile. Everything just happens. And I said, that's the most irresponsible thing I've heard probably anybody say. Uh, so this, of course, upset a lot of people. Uh, and so the talk started there because there's a balance, right? There's things that you have to be thinking about in architecture. And there's things that you don't know and you can't predict. And so trying to predict them usually creates overly complex systems. So that's how this kind of talk started. Hopefully, you dig it. If you get nothing else out of this, this is kind of my takeaway uh, for you all. Behind every architectural decision, there is a product assumption. Just as your products evolve and change over time because you learn new things, that architecture has to evolve with it. Uh, I was reading, at one of the tables downstairs, there was all those uh, handouts, and one of them was about technical debt. Does anybody here know what technical debt means? Yeah, what do you, what do you, what do you, what, what, what's your dig on it? It means that you wrote code that you thought was yeah, so you wrote some code, you thought it was do something, didn't quite do it. Anybody have a, a different take on it, or is that kind of what everybody's take on it? What do you got? It's more about uh, positive business making decisions and not taking the architectural assumption that might have been <coughs> a position that's down the road. And so we put the short side of the city. Yeah. And now we're paying for it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it, those are like the, the common uh, approaches on it. Uh, Ward Cunningham, the guy that came up with technical debt, I think uh, put it a nicer way. And I'll, so I'll kind of reframe it, at least the way that I like. Um, when we're thinking about building products, we shouldn't be taking shortcuts. We should be building things the best we can right now based upon what we understand. But then reality happens, right? And the thing we built to solve a problem that we thought we knew changes because you build things and you learn. And so technical debt is that gap between what you learned then and what, and what you know now. So I don't really, so the shortcut one, I, you know, I get that's kind of how it usually manifests itself, but I think it's a much more humane way. I think you're kind of teetering on that, like, now we know more about what it should do, and there's a gap between what we knew then and what we know now. Our, our, our product assumptions manifest them things in complex code and, and, and poor decisions. So let's talk about ways we can do this. This is what I think we can get out of our time together. I'm going to go through some visuals, and the visual is really the big takeaway. And I'm going to show you a bunch of ways that I use uh, kind of the same visuals over and over again. I use the visuals to help teams figure out what architecture is important now and what's not important now. So I, I like to talk about not worrying about all of the what's, but about some of the when's. When is this decision important? Do we know enough now to make it, or is this something we should worry about later on? I use leverage, I'm sorry, I use uh, product context to help us ground our decisions. And then last but not least, there's some ideas on documenting decisions. 
Again, I do a bunch of the Agile stuff. People say, there's no documentation in Agile, and I think that's kind of silly, because <laughs> there's some things that you might want people to know. There's people after you that will be working on your products. It's good if they have some kind of idea on why you made the decisions you made. All right. Let's start off with what is architecture. Is this simple enough? A little three-tier app. You got some web front ends, some APIs. The cool thing now is to call those microservices, so we can just scratch that out. You got some business logic, some data streams, simple problems. If you haven't read this book, uh, Notes on the Synthesis of Form from Christopher Alexander, I highly recommend it. It's an, uh, it's an older book, but it, the problems we solve, I think, manifested, he manifested very well uh, in this book. And so he talks about if you have a simple problem to solve, and in his example here, he's talking about building uh, housing units. There's interdependencies between all of those decisions. If you want something to be cheap, but you want it to perform, and you want it to be easy to build, they're not, in, they're not uh, distinct options. When you make something cheap, it might not last as long, and so there's gives and takes across these things. With simple models, you can kind of keep these things in your head, and it's easy to solve. The reality is we don't have problems this simple. Our problems are a little more difficult. So if you think about the systems you build, they probably have more of the top model. Lots of dependencies. Not, maybe not singular dependencies, but multiple dependencies. And they have gives and takes across all of them. What tends to happen with a lot of groups is that we have bias. We have bias based upon how we know the systems currently work, or how we know the technologies work, or how we know the frameworks work, or the things we want to do. <laughs> I really want to build more microservices in Docker. How could I make that happen inside this thing I want to build? And so we, we don't get an optimal decomposition of the dependencies. We get this suboptimal based upon our biases. And so what I'm trying to get teams to think about when you're building products is how to get to more of this optimal decomposition of, of an optimal grouping of these interdependencies. It's too complex to have them all be distinct. Are there ways we can apply groupings that help the, uh, the decision points be simpler. I do this through this idea of uh, product-based thinking, but this is things that architects need to be aware of. So this is the kind of model. This is the reality of your systems. This is what teams uh, kind of fall into. This is what we're trying to get to. I, I don't know if we ever get there. Is anybody in here? You're, it's a lot of architects. Would anybody say right now, my architecture is perfect? All right, good, because you would be the first. <laughs> So think about these things. Are the architectures you work on simple? They're not as simple as that first one. Do you have interdependencies and trade-offs? And do you get biased uh, uh, with your solution on your decisions? So let's get into these visuals. Uh, so this is a story map. Simple enough. Yeah. You're all certified story mappers. There you go, because that's <laughs> the value of certifications these days. Uh, but so yeah, you have an activity somebody's trying to achieve, steps along the way some of these user story stuff. The reality is not all stories are user stories, right? Sometimes there's back-end things that are happening. So we have system stories, and it just kind of makes a nice flow inside here. This is a bigger picture of a, of a story map, just to kind of give you context. Uh, what you see in the greens are some of the stuff the first time I was talking about, personas. Some of the reds are the activities or the, the, the things they're trying to achieve, and then some flows across systems. Uh, to achieve these goals. If I show you an example of that, then I'll get into some of these better modeling around decision points. Anybody want to guess who's the architect in this picture? The guy standing up that's kind of like, oh, I don't know about this Agile stuff, right? This is what we're doing in here. This is actually a, a tax accounting uh, software. This is, oh, geez, I think a, a picture from about six years ago. But you can see some of the personas on this stuff on the left. We went through this story mapping exercise. <clears throat> all of these orange questions were the architects, or I'm sorry, all these orange stickies were the architects' questions. What about fault tolerance? What about data redundancy? How are we gonna get audited? What about security? And so what we're trying to get them to think about is, when were those questions relevant? It's not that they're not relevant, it's just more about when are they relevant and when do they come up? So this is kind of how these things started early on. You can see a bunch of his questions were, were, were kind of uh, uh, relevant in this, in this uh, secondary and third sprint. Some of his questions, we don't think they were relevant yet. And so we just kind of pushed them back to the side. 
But it's the start of making us. I don't see that a lot. <laughs> but it was the start of helping us make decisions. If I took this to a next step, this example you can see here is a much smaller story map uh, divided into three uh, segments, or four segments here. This is actually for a group that was doing Network 4.0, which was fun because the first question is, what happened to Network 3.0? They didn't have one. They just skipped it because Network 4.0 was going to be so much better. What I liked about this, and so the story behind this, was the network engineers were getting together to build Network 4.0. Sis, anybody here from Cisco? No? All right, cool. Cisco, <laughs> Cisco was coming in the next day to talk to the network engineers and say, here's all the features and functionalities we can provide for you. You should buy our stuff. When I was at Red Hat, I would do the same stuff. I'd come in and say, here's all the Red Hat things. You should buy these things, then your architecture is perfect. This, these network engineers didn't know what they needed. And so we sat down and said, what are some of the things you want to achieve? And so we laid them out, and we talked about what's the most important thing to achieve and what things aren't as important now. What I like about this is it's no longer about features and functionality. It's about necessity and meaning. And so we're conferring, uh, we're trying to get across uh, importance in finishing things as opposed to the features and functionalities that somebody could dump a white paper on you on. The nice kind of step after this story is that, so Cisco comes in the next day uh, ready to do their pitch, uh, and then they left and they said, we don't really have the right people here to have this conversation right now. So I thought that was a win for me. <laughs> Taking a step further, here's an example of a story map. So taking the simple domain of building an online uh, travel site. Story map, in the reds you have some of your users, Yellows are some of like the macro level activities, and then some, a bunch of the stories that they might want to do to achieve some of these activities. If you were to build this travel app, there's a lot of decision points you should do inside, you'd be thinking about inside here. You'd be thinking about, well, well how do I worry about security and uh, making sure that people, the payment processing is right? Do I worry about real-time data and making sure the seat's available right now? How do I integrate with ex external systems? How do we, ex how do we integrate with external uh, uh, point providers? What's important? What's important? And you run this risk of having too many things. You run the risk of getting this, this super complex model of all the possibilities of the things you could do, and you get overwhelmed with decisions. If you take it and you were to apply an intentional constraint and say, what if we were just worrying about a family traveling? What architectural decision points are important for that group? So if you're thinking about it, so I, I, have, uh, I have a lot of, well, I don't have a lot of kids. I have three kids. Feels like a lot of times. But when I'm booking family traveling, I tend to not worry about, I'm going to buy right now. Right, so, I, so I'm not worried about buying right now. I want to kind of do a little bit of research, and I want to come back to it. I want to play around with it for a little bit. Now, if you're the architect and you're thinking about this experience, and you're taking that into consent, uh, consideration, you might say, well, we don't need to worry so much about the, maybe the freshness of the data. We need to worry about the, uh, the ability to kind of come back and go and maybe do alerting on notifications. That's a different problem than if you think about a business traveler. When I, when, I, when I travel and I uh, go with clients, I tend to go the same place a lot of times. And so in that space, I, I really don't even care about the price. I just want to make sure that I can book over and over and over again. So architecturally, I'm thinking about how do I create this personalization engine so that it makes the experience simpler and I don't worry about a bunch of the nuances inside of it. Still going to have some data constraints, but they're a little bit different inside here. I want to have some notifications inside here, and maybe the notifications are more text-based as opposed to email-based or uh, push-based. Different approaches based upon the consumer of the, of the system. You take these approaches, then you validate that this is really something, a problem that we want to solve. If the product needs to change, then the architecture needs to change, but at least you're basing your decisions around some kind of uh, product idea you want to validate. Last but not least is the idea of an adventurer. I use this, this model for whenever I teach any courses. And so one person brought up to me, they said that they were a backpacker. Anybody in here do, when well, we're in Colorado, you probably all backpack, right? So that's kind of what happens. 
When this, when this dude was talking about backpacking, he said he wants the most painful trip possible because what he wants is he wants the longest delay in any city he can get, right? Because I mean, in essence, that's like free, you know, free adventure time. If I have a two-day layover in a city and if the ticket's cheaper, yeah, win for me. I can just crash somewhere at a campsite and have more fun. That's, that inverts kind of your assumptions around the product. Now it's no longer about how you're going to sort, how you're going to optimize. It's a different optimization. If you try and optimize for everybody, you win for nobody. So again, just thinking about these things. And this person, you know, he's more reactive. He wants you know, the, the worst possible uh, trips for duration. And he's going to buy on a whim. And so we need to focus on how do we make decisions that solve this problem. When you're going through and you're laying out these, these maps and talking about uh, what's important for different types of uh, uh, consumers, users, problem spaces, you eventually come into this point where, <laughs> where uh, you have to make decisions. I think this is a nice, simple way to lay out your arch architectural decision points. You have things that you know how to do. You know how to do these things well. It's a known space. You have things that you're very uncertain about. We're not sure how we're going to distribute messages across a number of uh, distributed systems. We haven't done it before. You know, those are things you can kind of learn. Maybe we don't know if the problem space is right, and so we're, you know, we have to kind of test and validate a little bit down in here. And you have decisions that range from super dependent to drastically isolated, things that you have to get right. Things that you have to get right, otherwise the rest of your system kind of changes. And things that are pretty well isolated, and so if they change, it's not as big of an impact. If I were to overlay uh, some of the stuff I did at the Mercantile Exchange in this medium, or in this uh, matrix, you could see these decision points. The bigger these points, the more expensive it was to be wrong. If we got message latency wrong, it wasn't like we could say, we're agile, we'll get it right to the next sprint. Traders don't like to hear that, those kinds of things. They tend to use a lot of swear words. And so like latency had a lot of uncertainty for us because there were so many moving parts. There was not only network, there was not only code, there was how far apart the actual physical systems were versus the, uh, pl the platforms. Algorithms we knew pretty well, but still we couldn't get it wrong. And if we, and these were tied tightly to systems. There were things that we didn't know well, but we could separate out, like data segregation. Data segregation to me was, when we're, when we're publishing all this data, how do we optimize the delivery? Delivery is really based upon consumption. And so you really don't know that until you actually start delivering data. You can isolate it pretty well. If you do it wrong, it's, you're, gonna have some, so you're gonna have a bad time. And so we just started laying these things out. You could, you, if you use this with the idea of a story map to figure out what are your decision points, you can start figuring out, do we need to worry about these concerns now or later? If you're worrying about logging framework now, because you know, somebody wants to say, well, we have to choose if we're going to use uh, log4j or something else, it's asinine. I've been with groups that do it, but it's like, it's, it, if, if, that's, if your logging framework is big, you got other problems. So don't worry about those kinds of things. But this starts the discussion around how much time do we need to invest and when do we need to invest it. If you're starting up new and you have to do this message latency stuff, you probably don't want to say, we're going to tackle that in sprint one. Maybe you have to come up with a strategy around how it becomes the long pull that spans multiple sprints. But you have to figure out ways to integrate it earlier on. Taking this, these ideas to the next space with these microservices. Same kind of story map. This is just with all the, uh, the stories on here. Boxes in various colors here. I use these story maps to help teams drive out domains. And so in this very simple space, I'm just trying to say, what are the common domains and how would we create boundaries around our services that we think would be interesting based upon this product and then based upon use? If you have an existing platform, I do the same thing with groups. Let's talk about what the, what, the, what the experience is. Let's talk about what the stories are. Let's figure out those responsibilities and figure out, uh, are they right or are they wrong, or do we have to shift things around? 
You can do the same kind of story map and then extract out the domain uh, languages. Again, but I, I start here. This is, to give you context here, when teams are doing story mapping, if you, if you haven't done it, it's not just like the product owner goes off and does it and says, here, <laughs> you know, good luck. Um, I, I, I tend to have uh, a product owner as well as testers as well as engineers involved and experienced people, kind of the whole shebang. The only thing that changes for me is the size of the group. You can't do this effectively with 75 people, so you have to make decisions around how to get a smaller group and then play it back, but that's, that's solvable problems. But I, I need to have multiple perspectives. I need to think about how is this thing going to be used, how is it going to be designed, how is it going to be tested, how is it going to be validated. So I use this, this space to talk about microservices, to talk about boundaries. And then last but not least, so you know, same slide, new title, right? I use the, the same visual to start having teams talk, think, talk about uh, chaos engineering. A lot of groups assume that their systems never fail. Anybody have one of those, never failed? All right, well then you're all better than me. Systems fail. And so if we're doing these mappings, talking about problems, talking about decision points, the next natural conversation then becomes what happens and who's impacted when these things go down and what should we do about it? Do we do cloud so we can do burst scaling? Is that really the right solution? Or maybe it's one of those things like, well, hey, you know, if this search thing goes down, uh, the business traveler is still in a good spot because he doesn't want to search. He knows what he's doing, so can we, is there a way we can still process and make money if we just circumvent this space? And so now you're talking about how do you prevent, how do you create looser couplings to allow the business to be more fluid? But you're thinking about these things through this big visual, talking about what could happen when things go wrong because ultimately they will go wrong. Kind of this, this thing in action here for you. This is a group that we're working on. Um, you can see some of the personas over here for the left. There is much more information around them, but they're, look, they're walking through some system diagrams as well as some stories talking about dependencies across this, this space. To give you context for this group, when they first started, they were building a new platform for, uh, all right, there's nothing that gives away the company here. Uh, they were building this new platform for company, this is a retailer, physical shops, right? So this is a, they're building a platform for vendors to sell products on store shelves. So a vendor has to come in and say, I want to sell X. They have to talk about how they ship it, what's the package size, what's the cost, the color, all these other illities of things, any kind of hazmat stuff, uh, the, all of these various items around the, um, getting a, a, a product to a store. It's not just one store, it's also 1,800 stores. And so there's supply chain, demand, all this other stuff that happens. So with this group, they're trying to redesign it, and when they first came in, they started off and they said, we're going to do microservices. And then the first thing they did was they built join as a microservice, which was fun. Like, they didn't change any of their models. Just all of a sudden, you do a query and it'll go to four databases. So you know, one database goes down, the whole system's down. That was a fun one. What, what we did for them is said, what are the right constraints that we can put against this architecture to start flushing things out? What are the things you have to get right? And what are the things we can figure out later? Some of the things they had to get right, obviously, were you know, store information. They had to get some data uh, proper. The hazmat stuff's pretty important because the hazmat took a long time to turn around. So they had to figure out some of these things well. They talked about the things they had to get right. And they said, what are, what's a constraint we can put against the system to get an, uh, a, a cut through that we can build against? So what they did is they said, what would it take for Procter & Gamble to put one bottle of Tide on one shelf? And that was enough to kind of tease through some of the architectural, the architectural concerns that they had to address now and defer the other things to later. So that was this example here. They're walking through it. Uh, it worked out much better. They threw away all the joint microservices, so everybody was happy. Last but not least, in these last few slides here, uh, you're going to be wrong. <laughs> so if you, do, if you don't think you will be, uh, either you're substantially better than I or... Uh, uh, um, or you're lying. <laughs> so think about these things. Uh, when you're wrong, what happens? This is what I have teams do. When you're building these things and you're thinking about documenting things, I talk about the product assumptions you're making. What are these product ideas we can validate 
and how they tie back against technical assumptions we make based upon the product assumptions. These are the things that I think are interesting to document because then, then you can talk about, you can come back to your assumptions and say, were these valid? And if they're invalid, what do we have to do to remove these things on the product side as well as the technical side? As you're making these assumptions, think of a few ways you might be wrong. If you can't think of any way you could possibly be wrong, you probably have an, 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 an implicit bias against your solution. So think of ways you could be wrong. And for those errors in judgment, or those ways you were wrong, what would you change based upon new information? I think those are interesting things to document and discuss and revisit as you build and learn. Think about your constraints. There's never been a perfect architecture. Use your, your, your product to ground your decisions and think about what you can do about these things. Sometimes your architectural constraints are accidental. You've made an assumption a long time ago, no longer valid, uh, so you have accidental uh, constraints. Sometimes they're real, sometimes they're assumed. I have a lot of groups that talk about uh, security, and I know there's a lot of security talks here. Security is real, but I work with too many groups that have assumed security constraints that when you talk to them, they really don't know, but somebody said security has to worry about it like this. And it's like, well, we should probably figure that out. So think about your constraints if they're assumed or, or actually real. Try applying new constraints if it helps you. Maybe it's not all of the databases or not all of the code or all of the services. Apply new constraints to see if it helps you figure out what decisions are more important now versus later. Uh, and lastly, kind of think about the models. Try to, not, try to be aware if you have these implicit biases, if you're doing uh, less than optimal groupings. And then figure out these, uh, this idea of journeys across a map to help you figure out when decisions can be made, what's important now, uh, and which ones are just uncertain enough that you have to build a little bit and, and, and test before you can make sure you're right. Our job, there you go, take a world of possibilities get good understanding around them, apply intentional constraints that help you learn to build maneuverable systems that bring joy, joy to your customers, uh, and joy to your future engineers. Has anybody worked in a code base that said, man, I love that engineer that wrote this five years ago? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't happen so much. <laughs> but if you, can make, if you can make the next engineer happy, that'd be pretty cool. Two good books, uh, the Weinberg book and Are Your Lights On? Jerry's books are phenomenal. The Systems Thinking's book uh, is, are great. Uh, and of course, Christopher Alexander uh, notes on the synthesis of form, some of those models from earlier on. The slides I put up on Twitter, uh, the link to them, so if you want to grab them later, uh, go for it. That's what I got. I, I pulled it off just in time. Yeah, what do you got? You if you guys don't mind uh, being a little late for lunch, we can do a couple of questions if we want to. Ah, there we go. I really enjoyed this talk, and I have a question for you. Uh, how, uh, what have you seen with adoption? Adoption of, of this? Of this approach. Uh, some challenges and some successes. Well, the adoption that. when I'm there is pretty good. No. <laughs> um, the, so the adoption. It's, it's kind of weird. So like using this idea of story maps, I think a lot of teams use story maps, but they, they stop at like just the user. And they don't use it to actually help them think about systems and think about constraints and think about architecture. And so uh, when, we've kinda, when we've helped teams explore it deeper, the adoption is pretty tight. But I see a lot of groups that would just read some Agile docs and they'll make some maps and then they think it solves problems and they don't really have the good conversations. Um, so I, it's, a, it's becoming more prevalent, it's just not prevalent enough. Yeah, please. Hang on, I have one there. Oh, sorry. I shouldn't point. Slide 19, you have the story maps and the, some boundaries around them. Yeah, give me a second here. What, what are the boundaries, the lines? Oh, for this one? Yeah, these lines were just when we were thinking about how would the microservice boundaries be. So the, those are the microservices boundaries? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Did yeah, that yeah. work so, okay to set the functional context of the microservices? Yeah, we could, yeah. So some of these would be like, so this was just around the search functionality. And so this was just like the domain of the search. This was the domain of, uh, of the, um, uh, the travel coming in to start the search. So this one's probably even a little bit looser. Over here we had some of the, the payment options. Here's some of the notification options. Here's some of the personalization options. 
But like when you start to when you start to model it this way, then you can actually talk about is the data actually separated? Because the last thing you want to do is start creating microservices where it's like microservice, 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 and then database that everybody has to come to. And so like I, that's a nice way to start talking about is, are the services actually distinct or are they coupled artificially? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So I didn't have so much as a question as a, as a comment, and that is. Um, I know we always pay a lot of attention to software quality attributes. And we have prioritized them. I mean, this is the first time I've seen so much attention on prioritization of functions, which I think is a good thing. I don't think we put that enough in our requirements. Yeah. So thanks. Yeah, yeah. The one thing I would add to that, like, I didn't touch it on here, but the, the keynote speaker this morning was talking about testability. Man, like when I'm working with groups on this, we're talking about testability for you know fourth parts. So we're talking about you know the the use of it but also making sure that we design systems to be testable. Otherwise, you kind of get into this non-maneuverable space. Yeah. OK, I think that is it. Thank you, everyone. And uh, lunch Enjoy is lunch. next.